Thank you so much for coming this evening. This talk is sponsored, co-sponsored by the Centre for Ukrainian Canadian Studies and St. Andrew's College. We're really blessed to have Dr. Kapp with us here this evening. He's a well-known personality in Winnipeg and abroad, a person who's done much to serve the community, locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, I just had the good fortune of recently getting to know him better. Uh, the talk is uh, tonight is co-sponsored by the Centre for Ukrainian Canadian Studies in St. Andrew's College. I just have to say I think we're really blessed to have Dr. Kapp with us tonight. Um, he's really well known in, in Winnipeg, and he's particularly because of his work for community uh, locally, uh, nationally and internationally. Um, Dr. Kapp is a professor of technology education, faculty of education, Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning at the University of Manitoba. Uh, he served as acting department head of curriculum, mathematics and natural sciences, the acting associate dean of education, undergraduate, Director of Imperial Oil Academy for the Learning of Mathematics, Science and Technology, Acting Director for the Centre for Ukrainian Canadian Studies for the Faculty of Arts. He's done so many things. These are just a tiny drop in the bucket of some of the many accomplishments and the many ways he served community. In May of 2011, he was also appointed to a professorship, Faculty of Philosophy, by the Academic Senate of the Ukrainian Fair Universität. Uh, UFU, a leading private graduate university located in Munich, Germany. Professor Kapp has an extended list of funded research grants and development projects and over 150 publications. Um, we're fortunate to have Dr. Kapp speak with us for about an hour this evening and then we'll have some questions. And I'd ask Yulia to say a few words in Ukrainian since my language is not very good, but go for it, Yulia. Шановні пані та панове, доброго вечора. Ми раді вітати вас у Центрі українських канадських студій при університеті Манітоби. Та сьогодні у нас є особливий гість, доктор Олес Цап, який є видатним науковцем та колишнім директором Центру українських канадських студій. І ми дуже є раді вітати його сьогодні. І лекція триватиме близько 45 хвилин. І після того у вас буде змога задати запитання. Дякую. Дуже дякую. Uh, Yulia, uh, thank you, Yulia, and Maureen, thank you for the introduction a little bit and sort of sets the pace a little bit for this evening's presentation. Uh, the topic is basically reflection on the whole of the law, a survivor's story, a uh, forgotten architectural gem, and also an artist's story. Uh, this presentation is uh, partially based on a paper that I gave uh, a few months back. Uh, at the uh, city, uh, Winnipeg City Hall on November 16, 2008, uh, for the 85th anniversary of the uh, Holodomor famine genocide. Uh, the painting that I put in here is reflecting 1933, is by Laurecia uh, Sinitovic. In fact, she, I believe she's joined us over here. She's a local artist, um, and her painting is exhibited across uh, not just the province, but across the country. So, so it was a pleasure also to have her uh, contribute. Uh, to the, the presentation with some of her original work that she has uh, produced. Uh, as a researcher, I have a personal history related to the events during the last century in Europe. Right? My mother, who was 93 years old, Holodomor survivor, and both parents survivors of Nazi slave labor camps. Uh, what they experienced has not been forgotten, for it's still haunting them daily. Physical wounds have healed over time, but the psychological and the emotional scars are still present. And so as a result of that, I believe that addressing human rights issues is important for me personally, and I think it's important also for society at large uh, to be involved in that kind of topic and that, and that type of uh, theme. Uh, some of the uh, topics that I'll just briefly touch upon, I'm not going to give you a history of all of them all. I think you've heard that from other speakers that are uh, specialists in the area itself, but I did want to uh, talk a little bit about how food is used as a uh, uh, as a, um, as, a, as a as a power mechanism uh, or as a uh, basically as a as a process uh, for destroying uh, individuals or groups of individuals. I highlight two Ukrainian artists, one from Kiev and one from Winnipeg, whose unique work reflected the whole of the model. So I'll try to touch upon that. And then I want to share with you a, a hidden architectural project. Uh, with that of the National Museum, uh, the memorial basically in Kiev, Ukraine. Right? So I'll, I'll give you an, uh, an opportunity to uh, familiarize yourself a little bit with what is transpiring. 
Uh, food, as you know, is a human rights issue. Uh, I've just highlighted a few of the articles or the documents that where you can actually find uh, articles related to food and that food is a basic element of life, a source of energy, and without food, impossible to sustain life in any way. So you have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, 66, the Convention on the Rights of Children uh, from 89, and I've also added the uh, 2010 Indigenous People and United Nations Human Rights System. So this, each one of those documents has specific articles that deal with food, the importance of food and how we have to uh, provide for, uh, for children, if that's the case, and, and the importance of it and so on. Uh, basic elements of life, I mentioned some of that. And uh, what's important also is that uh, it has become a, geo a geopolitical weapon. right? Uh, it's not a new concept, but a a potent one, uh, one that for some reason works, uh, and food has also be, uh, is used as a means of persuasion, coercion, and behavior control. Right? So some of the uh, researchers in the field basically mentioned that this is a mechanism that is in place. It's also a weapon of war, right? Whereby uh, or intentional military tactics, where people basically surround the city, a town, a castle. And, uh, and try to starve the people out. And so uh, uh, Van Schaak, Myers basically referred to that, that, it's a, you know, that this is a strategy and a way of starving out, of starving out the inhabitants in the area uh, that they want to basically de destroy or, or overpower. I just put up a few castles. We have at least some examples of uh, that you know, individuals or enemies may surround a particular castle and they may basically uh, hold on to it for a few months, a few weeks, until they finally uh, know that there's no more food, no more water available and the people are starved out. So you've got over here the one from Kamenets Bogiski, I think you're familiar with that one, uh, and Polisko, which is uh, just an hour and a half, two hours north of Lviv, uh, as an example. Each of them sits strategically on the hills uh, and each one has uh, its walls and, and f these are fortresses uh, that are basically uh, uh, in place. Uh, so food basically becomes a weapon, all right? And as I mentioned before, uh, that there are many crimes against humanity when it comes to power and control of the destiny of human beings, but to use food as a means to alter their lives or uh, whether indiscriminately deliberately or through simple omission, right, is unconscionable. But yet, this still continues today, right? You would think, well, you know, we used that strategy before, but it's still happening currently uh, in the field itself. Uh, a few examples that we have, uh, historical ones, uh, for example, the Ireland one from 1840 with the potato famine and so on, uh, Holodomor 1932-33, East Timor famine, 1977-79, Ethiopia famine, 83-85. More recently, with the war that is going on, 217-18, uh, uh, we've seen cities actually being uh, surrounded and they try to starve them out. Uh, and I, I, I just put down, you can go on and on over here. You know, I'm not going to give you a list, but uh, it basically tells you that we know that it's a harsh way of functioning or uh, strategizing, but yet we still uh, regardless of the human rights uh, articles and codes, we still somehow uh, utilize that as a strategy to starve people out. <clears throat> Canada, basically, as mentioned before, uh, recognizes only five genocides, right? And that's why the museum, the uh, the Canadian uh, uh, Museum for uh, of Human Rights (CMHR) that's located in Winnipeg. Uh, also highlights five genocides. So Canada recognizes five, and the museum as a result focuses on five. There's discussions of adding a few others, but uh, right now that's the situation. The five uh, that we actually see uh, are the Armenian one, uh, 1915, the Holodomor uh, in the museum also, uh, the Holocaust from World War II, Rwanda, and the Bosnian War. Right, so those five are recognized by the government of Canada, but also they are highlighted 
uh, in the, the local museum over here that we have uh, in Winnipeg, the Museum uh, of Human Rights, Canadian Museum of Human Rights. With regards to uh, uh, the Government of Canada, on May, uh, I've got to remember, May 29, 2008, the uh, Government of Canada passed uh, Bill C-459, and I mentioned over here James Bazan, the Honorable James Bazan, which is a Manitoban. Uh, he was one of the individuals behind that particular act, uh, an act to establish the Ukrainian famine and the uh, genocide of the Memorial Day. Uh, so that's a, 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 major, a major contribution uh, to uh, the Canadian scene. And uh, so that was passed on May 28, 2008, uh, uh, in that particular setting itself. With regards to genocides and numbers and so on, uh, recently was in touch with CAVE, with the memorial, and they, in the past uh, year or two, have established a section whereby they highlight uh, various individuals that have brought up the issue of demographics and numbers. Uh, because we're still discussing what are the numbers, should it be 2 million, 2.5, 3, 6, 7, 10, and so on. So that, aspect is uh, under discussion, even though we have some idea more accurately where the numbers are. But they have put in there a wall uh, inside the museum, a separate wall, uh, where they profile individuals, uh, major individuals that also are uh, specialists in the field, but also individuals that at that time indicating the approximate numbers that they estimated possibly died from Holodomor. So you have James Mace, 1982, you have Robert Conquest, 1988, Kondrasyshin, 91, Stanislav Kuczynski uh, in 91 also, and each one has, it says how many millions. You have Taras Ulukalo from Montreal, uh, he did put out one of the first films on the Holodomor, the unknown Holodomor, it's available on, online, and yet if you Google it, uh, he estimates 10 million, uh, and so on. So there's a list of individuals like that that are profiled. So I'm not going to go into the debate of the numbers themselves. However, uh, I do want to emphasize that uh, recently uh, there was uh, an individual that was visiting Winnipeg and he tried to clarify some of those particular aspects. All right, so in, in the short period of time, uh, so I'm just looking over here, here we go. Uh, Volodymyr Serichuk, he comes from Taras Shevchenko uh, National University in Kiev. Uh, he basically, his title of the, the topic that he had was Number of Holodomor Genocide Victims, 32-33 uh, Archival Documents and Political Versions. He gave a talk at Osaredok on October 10, 2008, not too long ago. And he basically uh, challenged the 3.9 million deaths offered by some demographers. Uh, his belief was that the data collection uh, methodology was based on Soviet statistics which were flawed and intentionally falsified. And so he basically just came out and questioned basically the approach. Uh, he believes basically that over 7 million Ukrainians died from the whole Okay. He, he used a, a different approach from other uh, individuals that were gathering data. He was mostly focusing on schools, records, school records and data of uh, administration, how they were collected, how many people attended and so on, which was a little unique from what was done in, in the previous uh, years by some of the researchers. So it was very interesting to hear him uh, share that information with us. So uh, he examined particularly school enrollment data. Uh, the killing of those attempted to cross the Soviet border fleeing Holodomor. Uh, he talked about artificial cover-up of Ukrainians' deaths and replacements by Russians. And then also the percentage of deaths that were purposely not registered. Right? So a number of deaths just weren't recorded. And so based on all that kind of information, uh, he basically says, it's around 7 million, according to him. He further goes on, he gives us an example, which uh, opened up my eyes even more. He took as an example first graders in Cave province. And he said in 1932-33 school year, there were 675,450 children registered in those grades. Right? And on January 1, 1934, the province of Cave 
what he noticed is only 168,000 kids were left. So the question he had, well, where, what happened to all the children? Right? From 675 to 168,000. And on September 30, 1933, these, these children never showed up for school, for classes. Right? And so on the basis of that kind of data that he was collecting, he was, being, he was able to document, this is just one example, uh, that in fact uh, over 7 million people had died uh, from the organized famine itself. Uh, an act of genocide since Ukrainian independence. Uh, a number of countries recognize the genocide. I'm not going to go listing all those countries and they do, every year uh, new ones and even some of the new uh, some of the states in the U.S. also are uh, coming on board. So that's increasing uh, yearly. But since uh, Ukraine, a number of countries recognize the famine as an act of genocide. Right? So uh, Holodomor archives are becoming much more accessible. So since '91, we couldn't have access to a lot of the archives. Uh, archives have been opened up, so now we have access uh, to data and we're able to uh, get a better picture, hopefully, of what had transpired during that period of time. So there's more literature now <coughs> that is available to the public and uh, documenting the crime against humanity, so uh, it's happening more and more. Uh, I didn't list all the individuals, I just highlighted a few. I've uh, identified Applebaum. In 2017, she exposes Stalin's deliberate policy of mass starvation. So she refers to it, you know, as 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 a genocide. As we go through, uh, this is Anne Applebaum's uh, document or book, The Red Famine. And then we also have, uh, as an example, Stalin's genocide uh, by Norman Neymark, uh, which also uh, challenges the notion that Stalin's crime do not constitute genocide. He, in fact, compares Stalin crimes to those of, other, of another notorious killer, Hitler. So, uh, in the Stalin's genocide, it goes directly into that uh, particular setting itself. Right, so the, uh, I mentioned uh, Norman Neymark, and I mentioned uh, uh, his position on it a little bit. Uh, I want to move into uh, Lemkin. His name comes up more and more because he's the individual, Raphael Lemkin is the individual basically that coined the term genocide. Right? And so uh, he, co he coined the term genocide and then that sort of laid the groundwork for the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crime of Genocide. Right? Uh, so the document that you see uh, was approved, proposed and signed and ratified, uh, we're talking about December 98. It came into force in January 1951, and the United States uh, only came on board in 1980. All right, so just because it was produced in 51 doesn't mean that everybody came on board right away. All right. Uh, what about Lemkin? So I'm just repeating a little bit the dates you have it and so on. Uh, what I'm gonna, the reason I brought him up also is not just the dead genocide, but a lot of the speakers that come by, for some reason, don't mention any of this. And I thought it was important for us to know about this. For fear of repercussions, the genocide document, the convention that was produced with the article that you've seen previously, it was a watered-down version, right? It was weakened. It was political manipulation of the terminology and, and what uh, impact it may have. Keep in mind, the Soviets helped craft it and wanted to retain control of uh, the subject of Eastern Europe and its vast system of forced labor camps intact. All right? And for some reason, most of the speakers we hear, even the ones that come across, historians and so on, don't talk about this. And this is important because the, that particular document uh, uh, is a political tool. The Soviets basically used it so that they are not called out on the carpet, right? And it's a crime. And so one way to avoid that is to water down the language, all right? Uh, this is the document. If you're interested in doing some research, you want to read a little bit more about it. Uh, it's, uh, it was put out by Anton Weiss-Wendt in 2017, and it's called The Soviet Union and the Gutting 
of the United Nations Genocide Convention. Right? Uh, it's put out by University of Wisconsin Press. Right? Uh, and so you, if you're interested in that aspect, of, uh, then the, you're more than welcome to try to track that particular information down. Uh, Lemkin, at uh, the commemoration of the 20th anniversary of the whole war in New York, in fact, he was approached by the Ukrainian uh, Congress out in New York City to give a talk. He did that in 1953. Uh, he basically says that the whole of is a classic example of complete genocide of a nation, and he identifies four dimensions of this genocide in Ukraine. And I'm sure you heard that Seth Bin has been here to give a talk on it. A number of other historians have highlighted those particular aspects. But I just wanted to briefly touch upon this. Uh, one is the decimation of the national elite, the intelligentsia. Uh, this is what was happening, and that's what Raphael Lemkin uh, refers to. Uh, in fact, I went back to the Ukrainian quarterly back in autumn 1948, and just in 1931, uh, prior to 1932-33, 51,713 intellectuals were sent to Siberia. So, destruction of intellectuals uh, and people that possibly could create a movement to resist, shipped them out. Destruction of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. All right. And so I was looking at another source uh, by uh, Oneskevich and Romakovich, 2014, uh, called Contemporary Ukraine on the Cultural Map of Europe. They indicated basically that 32 Ukrainian Orthodox bishops were murdered and 10,000 clergy were liquidated between 1926 and 1932. They basically wanted to liquidate the spiritual aspect and the leaders in the church itself. Number three, the third one that Raphael Lemkin mentions is starvation of farmers. And guess what? Food is used as a weapon. Right? So we see that happening more and more. And then finally, number four, replacing the empty villages. Uh, this is basically a, a cover-up. Art the artificial famine bringing in more Russians or destroying the ethnic unity of the populations uh, to facilitate the Russification of the area and cover up basically what they had uh, done. Uh, another name that comes up is Viktor Rud, or Rudd. Uh, he's the former chairman of the Ukrainian American Bar Association, but he's also an international attorney. attorney. And one of his blogs, uh, which appeared November 12, 2018, in the defense report, he basically says that we've been caught before uh, by ourselves. That's the name of the article or the topic that he, he had put, uh, put out. He says, we could do worse than ponder the lessons from our diplomatic recognition of the Soviet Union on November 16, 1933. All right? And that by de facto legitimizing uh, Stalin's regime, we became a player. No matter how it came uh, of the Kremlin's concurrent starvation politics in Ukraine. And basically says, food became the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. Right? And uh, Root basically... Uh, in that document has a listing of the exchange of diplomatic letters that went between uh, the Soviet Union at that time and Washington. So Roosevelt was responding to some of the, uh, the recognition that happened. And they knew at that time that there was a famine going on, but it was covered up and they felt we need to, to move along. <laughs> The other dimension, I mentioned to you about the Ukrainian artists. Uh, an artist that uh, sort of moved me a little bit because when you read the literature, uh, his name is Kazimir Malavich. And I believe uh, there's a document in the center that you have a real copy of it too, uh, that has been produced. Uh, it, there is a YouTube of, of him, so if you're interested, it's in English. That's, you can go and watch it. It's about 10 minutes. I'll give you an overview about him, uh, his life, uh, and his Ukrainian background. Uh, but he's born in Kiev in Ukraine in 1879. Uh, and the literature and also the French uh, artists in the field, and I'll just highlight it a little, a little later on, mentioned that he seems to have been the only artist to capture the whole the modern 1932-33. As you know, Stalin wanted to make sure nothing gets out of Ukraine, any photographs, any, anything that shows starvation. Right? Uh, 
And then when I began to read that, I, and I stopped by the word only, and I, and I said to myself, as a researcher, I usually, it's a strong statement to be able to say only, right? So I tried to track to see if, if there's anything else that is available in the, in the area itself. So I did find other type of, uh, uh, other drawings. Uh, but his special drawing in 1930 illustrates the three figures, uh, three figures where faces are replaced by the hammer and sickle, a cross and a coffin. So in one of his paintings or sketches that he's done, he's got three faces, and on each of those faces he's replaced a, uh, a hammer and sickle on one, a cross on the other, and a coffin. Right? Uh, so somehow he survived that era, but that was one way of uh, acknowledging what was occurring at that time. Uh, he's also an avant-garde artist, so he had a profound impact on the development of abstract art. Now, I did put in parentheses at the bottom, Ukrainians have to begin to deal with cultural appropriation issues. Right? Artists, musicians, and so on. I could go on and give you a whole list of, uh, of individuals that other countries basically have appropriated. And Kazimir Malevich has been appropriated by the Russians. His name is Polish. He's Ukrainian, but yet he was brought in in the Polish environment, but all his communication was in Ukrainian. He spent a little time in Poland, so Poland is claiming him also. And so you have this issue that needs to be, to some extent, addressed by researchers in the field. Right? Uh, this is an example of the, uh, uh, the uh, Malevich's uh, painting or drawing. So if you look at the first one, you can see the hammer and sickle there on the head. The second one, the cross, and the third one, the coffin. Right? So that's the only one that I could locate that actually indicates that there was a whole demora and this was his way of expressing it uh, in Ukraine. This is a picture of him. And there is, uh, if you're looking for other sources, there's a French art historian, Jean-Claude Barcat. He has a book out called Malevich, was published in Cave. Uh, and there's also uh, an article that's called Eight Things Associated Kazimir with Ukraine. Right? So why, why is he Ukrainian? Right? Otherwise, what will happen is, is uh, uh, the cultural appropriation aspects begin to be appropriated by other countries. And so, uh, as I mentioned before, I was looking at the term only artist. And uh, I said, I need to examine if there was anything else. So I looked a little closer, and I found that a nine, there's a 1933 famine edition of Shulchenko's Kobzara. Hmm. I didn't know that. Hmm. And for me, it was interesting. Uh, and it, a copy had survived, right? Because the government at that time, the NKVD, that was in place, they basically destroyed all the copies. But somehow, one copy survived. It features drawing sketches of Stalin's famine rather than the Tsarist Russia in the Kobzara. So the illustrations on the inside should reflect Tsarist Russia, but they reflect the famine, Stalin's famine. And so Vasil Sedlar, he was the illustrator of that Kobzara. And Ryczynski was the editor of that book, of the Kobzara. Because they published and created that, they basically were both arrested and executed. But a copy has remained. Right? And I, I wanted to share that with you because I think that's important. Uh, if you're interested in, in this particular uh, 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 individual, Sedlar, uh, they're available on the Internet Encyclopedia of Ukraine under Sedlar Vasin. Uh, it's uh, clevelandohio.org. Uh, uh, you can track down that information also. But uh, for me, it was fascinating to know that it wasn't just one person, and there are, there's another one that is available. What does it look like? So I went in the document, and this is from the Kubzan. All right, so you have the Sidlar's picture. This is from the Encyclopedia of Ukraine, the internet one. This is an example of the Kubzan Shevchenko. You can see what's happening. Uh, illustration again over here, people lining up, right? And then I've got one more for you. Uh, illustration from Kobzal, and then also the dragging of dead bodies. As a result of what they produced, they basically both the editor, the publisher, and the illustrator were executed. Right? So if you're interested in that particular aspect, then that's something you may want to 
explore a little bit more. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, victims need to share their stories. Uh, I want to come to my personal story or the story of our family, our mother, but I wanted to also uh, create some foundational documentation that will set the stage for the story itself also. And so, uh, uh, Judith Herman, basically in her book called Trauma and Recovery, uh, she says that victims must also be given a chance, an unfettered chance towards recovery by helping them regain credibility to expose perpetrators by sharing their traumatic stories. They need, they need to share, to talk and share their stories. Uh, remembering and telling the truth about terrible events are prerequisites both for restoration of social order and for the healing of the individual victims. All right? So uh, an individual will have an opportunity to share, talk, and it's a way also of trying to heal uh, what has transpired and what has occurred to them. Uh, while they were out there. So I'm going to be talking now briefly about a whole more survivor story. Uh, uh, and just wanted to put a setting into it. So one such traumatic story was shared with our family by our mother Valentina. She's a whole of the war, was a whole of the war survivor from 1932-33. And both parents were survivors of the Second World War Nazi slave labor camps. So it's, for me, it's like nearly a double whammy uh, of survival. And sometimes we, we think we had a hard time uh, in the context where we are. Uh, so to, to, to hear these things. But starvation was used as a means of torture and slow execution in her small town located near the Sea of Azov. And so I just put a map up there temporarily so you can see. This is the Black Sea, the Sea of Azov is here. And Bergyansk is right here, uh, right at the bottom. Uh, and in fact, when the whole demand occurred, uh, it occurred on the eastern side of Ukraine. All right. Uh, so my mother was born April 13, 1925, in southeastern part of Ukraine, Berdyansk, and it's called the Zaporozhia or the Zaporizhka Oblast or province in Ukraine. And several years ago, I had an opportunity to travel with her to that part of Ukraine, experience firsthand the location where she grew up. She, at that time, began to open up even more about that painful experience. As a seven-year-old, she witnessed a traumatic event, daily death all around her, and cannibalism. She also was given the task of taking care of her younger twins, a sister and a brother. While her mother had to go to work and find food for the family, prior to leaving the house, she would wet and roll a handkerchief with a pinch of sugar so that the kids had something to suck on. This strategy uh, was hoped would appease their hunger. It worked for a small while, but due to lack of daily food, the kids were continuously weak. These daily cries of hunger, of hungry kids, turned into high-pitched screams. So basically, starvation wrecks havoc on the immune system, and in the end, stage brings with it large bellies. And I think. This, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, my mom, and this is the, uh, the picture in which uh, Oresya Senitovich basically shows the large belly of the child. And when you look at that, you would think, well, they shouldn't be hungry because look, they look full. But that's one of the elements, uh, reactive elements of hunger, uh, the bloating that happens, the large bellies. It sort of gives you an illusory, uh, sort of an illusory impression that starving children are well fed. Uh, this event, uh, basically the twins finally died a horrible death. And the event affected her tremendously psychologically, physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. She mentioned and reminded us on a number of occasions that prior to the twins' death, she had an apparition of Jesus in the large window of her main door. A voice calmly said to her, uh, Do not cry, I will come tomorrow and take them away. The next day, they basically died. Uh, so, mom would repeat that constantly for us, of the apparition and so on. And for us, sometimes it's just hard to understand, but her being in a setting uh, where family is in progress, 
psychological, emotional pressures and so on. Uh, it's hard for me to explain the, the, you know, what she, she has gone through. Uh, there's also an impact on the... <clears throat> before I go through the impact, there's also an interview with my mom. Uh, my brother Ihor, uh, while she was still alive, basically did an interview with her. It's in Ukrainian. Uh, but if you're interested in uh, hearing her, that would be the website where you can go and, and listen to her talk. He's actually interviewing her, uh, and you can see she's emotionally a difficult time for her, but she at least tells us what had occurred, what had transpired in that particular setting as you go through. Uh, there's also uh, an impact on family members. Trauma can also come in another form. So I'm a, ch a child of a little more survivor. Family members are not immune. It also affects them, especially when you learn that the person that brought you to this world you dearly love survived the greatest genocide of the 20th century, the Holodomor. Every time you mention the Holodomor, she would experience an emotional trauma, and tears would begin to roll down her face. And you can actually see that also in the video. After 66 years in Canada, she was still under the impression that it could happen again, here to her four children. So she continued to carefully store away extra dry food in various closets of her home. Over time, she would create a small food bank. This way, she would have ready accessible dry food for just in case moments. Other times, she would put a small amount of money in a handkerchief by tying a knot into it. In her mind, this was another preventive measure, a backup system of sorts. Her belief was that in an emergency situation, should the economy deteriorate or collapse, or safe funds for some reasons are not accessible to people, she still would be able to buy some food. <clears throat> when we had family meals, once in a while you were reminded to finish your plate. Uh, you know how kids behave today with their food? Right? We're all picky, a lot of leftovers. Well, in our case, if you did leave some food, she would, on the plate, she would say, Oi, Boja, or Oh, God. If you only knew what it means not to have any food on the table. But who were we to understand what she had gone through, right? When you have everything so readily available to you here. Mother did not have access to any trauma survivor treatment or therapeutic interventions but she had developed her own strategy of internalizing that trauma by interacting with other survivors on the Holodomor Remembrance Day. These are just some examples of, uh, of uh, Holodomor Remembrance Day. These pictures are from uh, Ivan uh, that he's taken. Uh, my mom is with the blue jacket here, and she's also in the center with the candle. Uh, one of my brothers is in the back here, you heard. I'm already on the other side. Uh, but she basically... Uh, use that as a way to, uh, to interact with other survivors. Uh, to Remember much of the stories to relief. Uh, she would involve herself in Ukrainian community life, church, and having a strong family support. My mother, through her stories and by example, taught us about integrity, courage, and fortitude. This remarkable survivor also demonstrated strength, resilience, and gratitude to Canada. But yet, after spending nearly 67 years in Canada, she still seemed to somewhat mistrust the system. And this is due to her traumatic experience as a child. Flashbacks of famine and daily death. She recently, on March 21, 2019, just about a month ago, passed away at the age of 93. Prior to her untimely death, she lived with dad, uh, who is 97 and continues, uh, dad continues to reside at Holy Family Senior Home here in Winnipeg. Uh, since both parents had endured challenging times in their life and were unable to complete their education, they in turn had high expectations from us and wanted to see their children succeed in this new adopted country. Their survival and sacrifice they felt would not be in vain. Our success they felt would be a joint celebration. So it's interesting to note that all four of us, uh, the three brothers and the sister, we all ended up in a, te in a helping profession. As a teacher, my sister, 
as an instructional designer, one of my brothers, as a school principal, one of my brothers that is sitting currently here in the front, and as a university professor. So for some reason, we all ended up in a profession where we help uh, people in, in various capacities. Uh, that touches a little bit on the, uh, those particular aspects, the art, the whole of the mode itself, and the context in which uh, we had also to adjust to that particular setting. I want to talk a little bit now about uh, the Hall of the War monument in Winnipeg, uh, sculptured by Roman uh, Kovai. Uh, the Hall of the War monument, located in front of Winnipeg City Hall, served and continues to serve as a gathering place where we can, for just a few moments or a few uh, time or a few minutes if necessary, uh, on National Hold Mother Day, join in solidarity with Ukrainians worldwide in remembering this atrocity, the genocide of millions of Ukrainians. <coughs> it was designed by a well-known Ukrainian-Canadian artist, designer, sculptor, and mold maker, Roman Kovai. So, that's the one I'm referring to, the one in front of City Hall. And you have the artist uh, uh, here also, uh, uh, artist picture here. On June 24, 1984, this monument was unveil unveiled by the former mayor of Winnipeg, Bill Norrie. His sculpture depicts, uh, I think there's two variations. Uh, one, it could be uh, uh, perceived where the mother and child is in a coffin. Uh, I, I prefer uh, that it depicts a mother holding a child in her arms and being squeezed to death by a vice. So depending on how you see uh, the uh, the, the sculpture itself, but I'll leave it up to you to decide what fits best your visual, your, your, your views. Uh, but he, uh, I just wanted to cite him, uh, which I found very interesting. He said that once the sound of the ceremony fades, uh, of the sculpture itself, and everyday routine of people's lives resume, it's the aesthetic presence of the sculpture that remains to give those nameless victims a memorial and a voice. And I found that a uh, very uh, strong statement. I just wanted to share that with you as we, as we go through. Uh, I also felt that it was important to add his wife. Uh, she also not just supported uh, and so on, but uh, you know, was involved basically in his work, helped out through the process itself. And, uh, uh, and sometimes we tend, we tend to forget uh, that uh, it could be vice versa. Sometimes it's the, the, the woman that is the artist and the man is supporting, or it could be the woman in vice versa situation supporting the artist. So she, she basically was on board 100% uh, with him. And so here you have uh, Halina Kovai, this is a photo from Norbert Ivan, and also uh, the husband created a sculpture of her. So uh, I found that uh, you know, pretty moving as you go through. Uh, if you're interested uh, in knowing and reading a little bit more about it, the pictures come from the Ukrainian Winnipeg, number 37 and 39, 2018. Uh, there's usually magazines over here downstairs that are available to you. Uh, you can read about uh, him as an artist and his work. There are a variety of examples of his work that are there. Uh, I want to move now to Kovai the architect. He was profiled in 2001. Uh, to, me, uh, to me, I felt that uh, Roman Kovai, the, the artist, his legacy continues. And even maybe to, to a notch, uh, a little higher uh, a stage, when his son decided to become an architect. He prefers we refer to him as Kovai. Because of his artistic work and creativity, he was actually profiled by Pearson David in 2001. And this is a, an important American book that had come out entitled New Organic Architecture, The Breaking Waves. This was published by University of California, Berkeley, Inc. and Los Angeles. And in there, there's a whole section about this young Kovai, which is here in Winnipeg, and in fact, he's sitting with us over here in the back. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, just to see him here at the end of this particular session. Uh, Kovad, the architect, the one that we currently have here among us, decided in 1993 
right? To take part in an international competition organized by the All Ukrainian Association of Researchers of Holodomor, Genocide 1932 33. Marion Kotz, a Ukrainian American community activist and board member of this organization, spearheaded this initiative. Right? Uh, he felt basically that North America had already, in several places, monuments of the whole of the world. I believe there was one already in Edmonton, uh, Winnipeg, and so uh, he felt that Ukraine needed to have a whole of the world monument. And so the main goal that he had in mind, Marion Cox, uh, through this international competition, was to commemorate the 60th anniversary of this strategy of this tra tragedy and having architect design a monument which would depict the best representation of the victims of the whole of the war. And so uh, for this competition criteria were established. You might not be able to read it. Uh, it's, it's fake. I can see it over here on my sheet but you might not be able to see it. But if you need to see it I do have a copy of it. Criteria were established uh, in 93 and also distribution of cash prizes first prize five thousand dollars second three thousand third prize two thousand dollars were made available to all interested participants all right all projects were be had to be submitted to the cave office in Ukraine and they were to be reviewed by a jury of excellence the selected monument was to be built in cave on a recommended location of the architect that has produced a particular design. Panel members were asked to express their judgment on the projects, but they were not able to gather the necessary votes for the first, second, and third place winners. So they therefore decided to select the top seven submissions. Right? This is in 1993. And so, on this particular sheet, you basically have uh, the answer from Cave and from uh, uh, Marianne Kotz indicating that here are the top seven candidates that they felt uh, the need to acknowledge. Four of them are from Cave. This is an international competition. Four are from Cave, one from Ternopil, one from Venezia. And guess what? One from Winnipeg. The Kowali architect. Each one of them were allocated an honorarium of $500. Okay. And, and their uh, projects basically were exhibited in cave. And shared, I mean somebody had to examine and look and share and decide to what extent we're going to go with this. Now, uh, 42, this is the, uh, the, uh, the rendering that Koval uh, created, all right, so just view it very carefully from the center, right, and you can see the people over here, this is a side view I believe, uh, and this is the entrance over here to the, uh, uh, to the monument or the memorial itself. Right. I'll give you a little more detail about it as we go through. This is the top view of what he had uh, produced. So what you've seen, the tower, is here in the center. Right. The entrance to the memorial. And then the memorial complex uh, organized uh, around. So this is the plan from the top view. For those that are in architecture, it gives you at least a visual illustration of what it looks like. Now keep in mind, this was created by him and submitted in 1993. All right. If we look a little bit further, this is the same uh, plan on the right-hand side. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Uh, and he located it because the architect was recommended where would you like to see it. Uh, this is the Verkhona Rada building. Right next to it is the palace. 
where the president meets and so on. So it was in the park here. All right. So it gives you a sort of a three-dimensional view of what this looks like. All right. So uh, basically, the basic elements that we saw in his proposal, uh, his project, you all see the central pillar, right? The central pillar of his project, the concept, right? You can see it there. Circular plaza around the central pillar, right? Uh, the memorial. The entrance that has to be into the, uh, the memorial itself. And also the location that he placed. By the way, the location is very close to the currently proposed site. It's only about a kilometer away. And on the same street. Right? Let me just add a little bit more information for you as we go through. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the design tower that uh, Kowada proposed, uh, we're talking about 49 meters or 161 feet. The tower proportions are in there. Uh, the 2008 memorial is about, this is an estimation, about 35 meters. But again, if you add the 6 meters for the flame at the top, right, uh, the number slightly changed to 41. So you've got 41 in the 2008 memorial, approximately. It's 29 and 35. 29 and 35, so uh, the, the numbers are there. Yeah. All right. All right, so uh, let me just uh, move on a little bit. All right, so uh, 13 years later, if you're still with me, 13 years later, on November 28, 2006, the Parliament of Ukraine recognized the whole of the war as a genocide against Ukrainian population, and President of Ukraine, Viktor Yushchenko, signed the bill, which included a provision for commemorative events and the construction of memorials to honor those victims. And on May 27, 2008, and I think well, most of you will remember, the President of Ukraine visited the city of Winnipeg to receive an honorary doctorate from the University of Winnipeg, visited the Holodomor Monument that Roman Kowal also had uh, 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 created, and also uh, to speak to the people gathered at the Shuchenko Monument uh, on the grounds of the Manitoba Legislature. Uh, during this visit, when he was in Winnipeg, uh, Yushchenko, in 2008, the UCC Manitoba, on behalf of the Ukrainian community, gave him a sculpture entitled Hetman, created by the late Roman Koval. And during that time, Mrs. Koval gifted him with an album of her husband's work, which included, at the end also, illustrations of the proposed monument from 93 that Kovalev, the architect, had basically created, right? She said that when he saw the 93 model and pictures that Kovalev created, he was somewhat confused. When I saw those pictures, and also the memorial pictures, the same illustrations, I was shocked and confused. And I said to myself, well, how is this possible? The National Museum, the Holodomor Victim Memorial, was erected on the banks of Cave by the Dnipro River near the Pucheska Lavra. And this complex was conceptualized by Anatoly Haidamaka, and the architect was Yuri Kovalev. This is the memorial today. You saw the one that Kovalev produced in 93? And the plaza, this is the one that was produced by them in 2008. So you've got your entrances and you've got your exits. Right? So on the left hand side you have Kovalev's proposed uh, memorial in 93, 13 years later. You have this one. And so my question is, as I look at that, I become even more confused, right? If I just take the, the top off over here, which is supposedly a flame or candle, uh, and then look at the other issues that, ha that, that Kovalev had designed, 
uh, I have a problem. And so I'm not an architect or a specialist, but I think this is something worthwhile to explore in a little bit more detail. Uh, and if that's the case, then Winnipeg uh, is, is an important contribution, maybe, of Winnipeg, or has an important role to play in this particular approach. Uh, I should mention before I just wrap up that if there are graduate students that are doing a master's or a PhD that are interested uh, in accessing Koval's uh, archives, because he's got a whole list of, ar uh, of archives of work, artistic work and sculptures, uh, to contact either myself or yourself, uh, contact the center basically, and uh, we can then uh, initiate the communications with the Koval family for that. So I'll stop at this stage. I think I've touched a few items, raised maybe some eyebrows, uh, but hopefully that uh, gives you a little bit some insight, uh, some new things to consider as we move through the process itself. So thank you very much. Thank so much. First of all, I'd like to say we could use a course, a whole course. Uh, you know, I'm not kidding. If you want to, you have to talk, but um, I. Thank you so much for for sharing, you know, just sparking. I read a fair bit, but I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm blown away now. So much more to, to learn and and people to, to get to know in our community. This is amazing. Thank you. Um, do you have, does anybody have questions? Uh, Koba, did you have any input maybe with regards to your work or any comments maybe? Or? I can answer any questions. It's just the, 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 um, the size and presence of the design I did was based on the uh, premise that Ukraine must demonstrate its maturity as a nation by putting up a monument to such an important event that is of the same scale as the monuments that were put up all over Ukraine by their oppressors. And just a few kilometers down the banks of the Dnipro is that big, so what I call the Soviet Kurva on, on the bank of the Dnipro, <laughs> uh, which is 62 meters high. Uh, because of the scale of the surroundings that I chose, which I chose because of a historical, I couldn't go as, as, as big as that, but I felt you couldn't do anything less in, in, in terms of self-respect as a people than to put up something that, that is of, of, a, of a similar scale. Uh, and mine is like 49 meter tower and the building that houses the archives, which was part of the program of the competition, is 72 meters per side and it's two stories high and it's solid polished black granite all the way around and the only way to get in is that split in the stone on the corner which is only three meters wide and seven meters high. That's the entrance you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, the drawings are amazing and just so much more powerful. There's, there's yeah. more stuff on the website. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, well we thank you. Look. Thank you so much. So is it just chat with, with Thank you very much. Hat? No, we can't thank you enough. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story, right. the beginning of your story. Thank you to your family. Um, thank it, you for coming tonight. Yeah, it was a pleasure, and hopefully, uh, we'll have a chance to chat over coffee. Thank yes. you very much. Yaku. Yeah,